I'm really pleased to be able to introduce two scholars whose work is so important uh, because not only are they doing rigorous scholarly work, but both of them are very deeply connected to Haitian social movements and solidarity networks. Uh, and so the format today is uh, we will have each of the guests speak for 20 minutes and that will allow us uh, for, for time for questions and discussions. Uh, so I will introduce both speakers. We will start with Mark Schuler, uh, who is professor of anthropology and nonprofit and NGO studies at Northern Illinois University. Um, and he's an affiliate faculty member um, in uh, Haiti at one of at the Haitian University in Haiti. I'm sorry, I don't speak French, so I don't want to mangle the name of the university. Uh, he's author and editor of numerous books on Haiti, including Humanitarian Aftershocks in Haiti, uh, published in 2016. Mamira Prosper is an assistant professor of global and international studies at the University of California, Irvine. She specializes in research on black social movements in the Caribbean and Latin America, particularly Haiti. Dr. Prosper also serves as the international coordinator for the Pan-African Solidarity Network with community movement builders in the United States. Uh, so Dr. Schuler, do you want us, do you want to start us off? And sure. Thank you again. I would ask maybe those of you who are in the audience, perhaps to uh, turn off your cameras just for the formal part of the presentations, and then we will invite you to turn your cameras back on if you wish for the discussion. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and I love that it's a, the, deliberately a transnational thinking space and activist and scholarship space. So I'm honored to be joining my colleague, Mamira. Um, so I'm glad you're going to be second because you're going to hit it home. I'm, I'm just the foreign observer, um, participant observer. Um, so I, uh, I have been working in and on Haiti since 2001. I am affiliated with the State University of Haiti. Um, I should probably just put that in English so it's easier. So where are we today? Um, so today is three days before February 7th um, on Monday. Uh, even the most conservative uh, defenders of the former regime acknowledge that Monday is supposed to be a regime change, a democratic uh, regime change. So there's been a growing consensus among Haiti's civil society organizations. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Prosper is down with this term. I'm uncomfortable with the term uh, uh, civil society. We can talk about why. Um, but um, at the very least, it is a groundswell of, of um, formal organized collaboration between at this point, 600 organizations in Haiti to, to take Haiti's democracy back. Um, so how do we get here? Um, last September, um, a massive uh, deportation begins. And so the photos that you might have seen at the US-Mexico border in Del Rio, Texas, uh, who were like, why are people in Haiti coming to Texas? Um, and, you know, Biden is following his Democratic predecessors, uh, deporting more people. Uh, in in less than a year than Trump had his entire four years. Um, uh, unfortunately, he's earned the title of Deport deporter in chief, which was formerly uh, held by uh, his Democratic pre predecessor, President Obama. This followed on the heels of uh, two massive 7.2, 7.0 earthquakes in the southwest of Haiti, um, which was as powerful as the earthquake in 2010, which triggered a whole bunch of international aid and the like. Um, so 750,000 people lost their homes, uh, estimates of you know, 2,500 dead, um, people still in, in deep um, crisis uh, in, the, in the South. And there was, uh, this past week, uh, there were several four point something earthquakes, uh, followed by five point something earthquakes previous week. So people are very much in, in trauma. This followed the assassination of President Jovenel Moise, July 7th, 2021. Um, so it finally came to light that the New York Times put the pieces together. It was, it was surprising only that it was the New York Times that published it. Uh, we can talk about what some of the, the motivations behind the, the, the assassination. Um, Amira and I did write a piece right after, the day after the assassination, basically asking early questions. You know, the who done it was too soon. The question is, you know, what, who stands to gain and who stands to lose and what do the Haitian popular movements want? Um, that was for Nakla, we can put that in the chat 
uh, in the end. Um, but this, this was uh, the result that um, Moise felt that he had, uh, he was dependent on uh, organized uh, crime. Uh, I don't like the word gangs, it's very racialized. We'll call them armed or regular groups. Um, we'll call them neighborhood uh, territorial, you know, uh, organizations that were linked to, um, you know, they were deliberately organized, federated, the G9 is what they were called, um, not only uh, deliberately for the express purpose of supporting the Haitian regime of uh, Jovenel Moise, but it had the blessing of the United Nations. Um, so this is, should not be any surprise. Um, the number one supply of, you know, they do not produce arms in Haiti, they produce, they have to import them. Um, so the question is who's letting the, the guns come into the country? And so a lot of it was because uh, Haiti, uh, Haitian leader uh, Moise lost his grip on power. There was at 1.2 million people on the streets of a country of 11 million, um, largest mobilization in the country ever, and yet he's still in power. Why is he still in power? Um, because he, he thought he had the backing of former president uh, Trump, and Trump was uh, basically asking that uh, Haiti sever its ties with Venezuela, uh, which is a regional cooperation that started in 1815 when Haiti, the world's first free black republic, the second free republic in the Americas, offered very crucial assistance to Simon Bolivar, who liberated South America with assistance from Haiti in terms of finances, in terms of arms, and in terms of troops. That was a debt that uh, former Venezuelan president, uh, Cesar, uh, Hugo Chavez, often acknowledged. Um, so they locked Basically, this means federal strike, literally the locked country is the way it would be uh, translated into English. Why was the country in, in arms? Because there was, a, uh, relating to this South-South solidarity between Haiti and Venezuela, the Petro Caribe program offered $4 billion of assistance, uh, direct assistance to the Haitian government. And of that, about $2 billion or so half of that went either missing or went, um, uh, was mis misdirected towards uh, basically propping up the the regime of um, Jovenel Moïse. Um, so why why was this uh, triggered? Uh, there was in July sixth, two thousand eighteen, um, the during the middle of a World Cup match when they were when the president was assuming that Brazil would win, uh, they lost. Um, he announced the end of the gas subsidies. Um, so there's a 37% increase in gasoline at the pump. And they waited till the end of the match and then literally all over the country, uh, roads were blocked, including people uh, taking down billboards, entire billboards. Um, it was a very quickly organized and very effectively organized shutdown of the country since 2000 for two days. Uh, also related to Petro Caribe. So, um, yeah, so I'm going literally, I'm deliberately going backwards in time because I think it's important that Haiti, the people that, that are just coming to understanding Haiti, they just see the headlines and things don't add up. So we're, we're, I'm gonna try to work your way backwards. And, and um, I know Ramiro will be, will be talking about the, the, the social movement responses. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna uh, get us to that point. So um, before this, um, was what people in Haiti call the humanitarian occupation. Um, so the United Nations troops, uh, MINUSTA, uh, some 11,000 strong from 32 countries um, led by Brazil, um, uh, controlled the country for 13 years after uh, previous coup d'etat um, in 2004, February 29, 2004. Um, was the second time that, that Jean Bertrand RSD was, was deposed. Uh, and so for a couple months, the United States took the first uh, round of peacekeeping. And then as geopolitics have it, um, Brazil wanted a permanent seat on the UN Security Council and found common cause in France, who was a little upset at the time because the United States took its oil reserves from them in the war in Iraq. Um, so it was a way to get back at the United States to lead a UN, a UN peacekeeping mission for 13 years. And this, this occupation um, brought Haiti cholera, which almost 10,000 people died from, and hundreds of cases of sexual assault, young, young men and women, and children that um, you know, they called Minusta babies, that the UN, had, had, they have a status of forces agreement, which allows them immunity. So this, this is the context that, that people are talking about now. So, um, 
it, this is the uh, 2015, uh, so this is July 2015, the 100th anniversary of the US occupation. People were drawing parallels about the United Nations and NGOs occupying the country. So uh, the United Nations is a, a very controversial figure in Haiti. Uh, this is a protest right after the cholera outbreak. Um, the United Nations uh, uh, had named Bill Clinton as their, their uh, special envoy. And Bill Clinton uh, tapped Paul Farmer for his assistant. Paul Farmer is a well-known uh, medical anthropologist, uh, anthropologist and uh, physician. Uh, co-founder of one of the most successful health uh, responses, partisan health. Um, and so it was a bit surprising to movement leaders in Haiti that the United Nations spent five years trying to deny that they were the ones that brought cholera to Haiti. When it could have just been, you know, really quickly, yes, we did this and here's our response and they could have eradicated cholera. The Haitian people and the Haitian government, particularly the, the the director on water and sanitation did in fact eradicate cholera and lessons from that uh, could, could have been it learned and applied uh, with this latest pandemic of COVID, but not. So cholera, this is an acrostic poem on the wall at the uh, Faculty of Ology uh, where I teach. Um, this is a co conspiracy between NGOs and the government or the state uh, to eliminate the rest of the Haitians that didn't die in January 12th, 2010. To give you a sense of how, what people were thinking about. Um, and so, belatedly, uh, Haiti, uh, Haiti, the international response to Haiti um, was uh, mired in scandal. Uh, 2018, um, it finally came to light that Oxfam GB uh, employed their, their superstar of the humanitarian response after the 2010 earthquake, and he engaged in what uh, the journalists called a Caligulan sex scandal uh, in 2011. It just came to light seven years later. Uh, and so they were able to sweep that under the rug. In 2015, a very, um, you could call it um, provocative uh, expose by the NPR and ProPublica about the Haitian Red Cross who raised half a billion dollars and built six homes. For those of us who work on humanitarian aid, it's a little misleading. However, the, the, the public outcry is, well, where did the money go? Um, this is inside the university where I teach, Abatu uh, ONG, uh, down with all NGOs. To give you a sense of the, first, the level of frustration that people in Haiti have with the official structures. So when we're thinking about solidarity, we need to be decolonizing our imaginations about what kind of solidarity, what form. If, if it's civil society and NGOs, people in Haiti are gonna be asking us some questions in the major. So uh, this is a picture of Jani Ligiste. Um, he is a, a sociologist, a radical professor. Uh, his latest book, uh, 2009, uh, was the, it defines the radical critique of NGOs. He still uh, commemorated today because he was murdered literally minutes before the earthquake, uh, January 12, 2010. So uh, the book that was referred to is Humanitarian Aftershocks in Haiti, um, January 12, 2010, $16 billion in promised aid, $16 billion. Uh, if you divide that by the amount of people living in the country, um, it comes out to, you know, a 2,000 per household. You know, could have been, could have done very well. Um, could have done very much more than it did. Um, so the question became where did, uh, where did the money go? Uh, and uh, that led to a very defensive response by, the, uh, by NGOs and international aid agencies. And uh, those of us who were asking the question were attacked. Um, the congressional briefing was busted up um, by a group of NGO defenders uh, when we were just trying to explain. Um, I was in the crosshairs about a couple scandals, but the, eventually, um, probably because of uh, uh, Paul Farmer, uh, the UN Office of Special Envoy, Bill Clinton, published a self-critique in 2012. You can still look it up. It's, the website's still there, lessonsfromhaiti.org. Um, so three self-critiques were that uh, there was that lack of coordination and aid, and this is a result of having a weak state. And, they, and um, the earthquake was an urban disaster, yet the humanitarian tools, imagine a, a, a refugee camp that you can have uh, in, in a rural setting. So the question that people in Haiti were asking uh, was not just where did the money go, but what did the money do? So um, very quickly, 
uh, created new leaders, um, people that spoke one or two words of English became the camp leader because they were the ones who could quote unquote communicate with the foreign NGOs. Or if you're a Spanish NGO, with the, with someone in the neighborhood that speaks Spanish, etc. Um, often these leaders were, were tied to um, transnational evangelical organizations um, with an explicit mission on evangelizing population and missionary groups. It disrupted solidarity networks. Um, created division, uh, not only in uh, communities, but in families. Uh, it demobilized uh, the population and it created dependency uh, and, and depolitization. Haiti became known as the Republic of NGOs where people's mindsets, their, their aspirations were privatized. Uh, NGOs are, are the actors to make, to have solutions. Um, families split up very quickly. If you got the same bags of beans and rice and cooking oil for two weeks, if you were a family of two or a family of eight, most families made the decision to have create a you know a new a new household uh, with uh, a seventeen year old eighteen year old woman who is uh, a mother of a child. So they, instead of having one household, they have two. Instead of one bag of beans and rice, they have two. Um, and uh, aid increased violence against women. Uh, small arms report, so, sorry, small arms survey uh, came out with a report that 2% uh, of women in the country were victims of violence. Um, whereas inside the, the IDP or internally displaced persons camps, 22% of women were, were victims of violence. So um, we could, you know, have a familiar trope that demonizes black men, or we could say this is rules that the humanitarian organization set up uh, that prioritize women as recipients. But um, actually created the problem by creating these top-down, unaccountable mini NGOs that were headed by men. Uh, so there's lots of documented cases of transactional sex. So um, on top of this was the more media uh, coverage of uh, the Clintons. Uh, so Bill, Bill was uh, UN Secretary, the, the UN Office's special envoy, and he was president of the Clinton Global Initiative. After the earthquake, he also became co-president of the Clinton Bush uh, Haiti Reconstruction Fund. And the uh, he asked Parliament, Haiti's Parliament, to dissolve itself uh, in order to give all decision-making power um, of Haiti's development to the Interim Haiti Reconstruction Commission, which he co-chaired with uh, then Prime Minister Max Dalif. So. Um, a lot of folks in Haiti were talking about disaster capitalism. Um, so uh, they were called the king and queen of Haiti. Uh, Jonathan Katz uh, dubbed them this. Um, so in a book in 2008, uh, quick definition that, that we came up with was to uh, um, the instrumental use of disasters, uh, both natural quote unquote disasters, um, natural hazards and political events, uh, human created causes to empower a range of private neoliberal capitalist interest. Um, so capitalizing of the Castro was the name of that book, 2008. Um, so after the earthquake, uh, there was investments in tourism. Uh, Ile Vash uh, was the signature project, is the island of the, on the south of Haiti, uh, where the organized population, social movement said no, and they pushed back the disaster capitalism agenda but not after uh, destroying people and remove, destroying people's homes and removing them from their, where they lived for as, uh, as many as 80 years. Gold prospecting, so mining interests. Um, there was a contract, no bid contract that went to Hillary Rodham Clinton's brother um, and else. Uh, and there's uh, still an active uh, movement to, uh, pro to protest or pro uh, uh, to protest to, uh, mining contracts and also promote mining justice. Uh, so uh, Lumira has much more direct experience with that movement than I did. Um, sweatshops, the photo that you, that you just saw was the Clintons doing a ribbon cutting ceremony in Caracol in the north of Haiti. Um, supposed to prom promise to create 50,000 jobs. It created less than a tenth of that. Uh, it had started with taking people off their land, um, working with a South Korean uh, company to you know, basically promote uh, development and exploit Haiti's proximity to the United States and the fact that it has the lowest wages of anywhere in the hemisphere. Uh, current project, Mamira knows a lot more about than I do, uh, Savant Yang. Uh, there's a 
Coca-Cola uh, was interested in creating a stevia plantation. So the, the part of the uh, oligarchy that allied with the uh, government of Haiti um, was interested in creating this uh, uh, this plantation. So Andrea Paid uh, was part of the um, one branch of the of the oligarchy, the more national production capitalist part of that oligarchy, um, was in, uh, in involved in, in in expropriating and peasants from their land and creating this this plantation. Uh, disaster capitalism. Uh, relies on and uh, supports uh, the work of privatizing governments and creating new spaces for NGOs. Um, so NGOs are, are vehicles of quote unquote doing good, but they can become unwitting tools of uh, neoliberal capitalist interests. Response to this disaster capitalism is people that lose their homes, lose their jobs, uh, lose their livelihoods, um, unable to compete with foreign subsidized rice, for example, they leave. Um, 1% of Haiti's population that received its, uh, sorry, 86% of Haiti's population that, that has a college degree migrated out of the country because um, there's just no future because uh, of the, the role that the United States and others put, um, relegated to Haiti. So they went through Brazil and other places in South America because of the connection set up through, through the, uh, uh, the UN military mission. And Lula um, was interest, had a labor shortage. And so migrant workers, black migrant workers from Haiti were used to build stadiums for the World Cup and the Olympics. And then the right of center, uh, far right of center, Bolsonaro regime took over and saw that, you know, an, an opportunity to, to uh, basically reject a uh, population that was foreign and black. So um, this is a picture of, uh, Food distribution notice that there are women. That uh, this were uh, this was a, a prime example of how uh, aid turns people into passive victims. And um, people in Haiti talk about needing to understand the structural crisis uh, versus the conjunctural crisis. So um, what we're talking about today is the conjunctural crisis. Um, what's happening right now, uh, and so. This is, these are reflections of the structural crisis. Uh, NGOs uh, and uh, neoliberalism were brought into uh, the country as a result of the ouster uh, of the Duvalier regime during the, the Reagan era to create low wages, uh, low wage factory work for the Caribbean Basin Initiative. And this is on top of the US support for Duvalier, uh, including millions of dollars into secret police the Tonton Macoutes during the Cold War after uh, Duvalier sided with the U.S. to kick out Cuba from the Organization for American States. Um, so this circuit was, was created in the 1915 U.S. occupation of Haiti on the pretext that uh, uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, foreign interests, uh, German financial interests were taking over the continent. So this is an opportunity when the when the, the European continent was at war to take over. Uh, before the formal occupation, the US stole the gold reserves to have Citibank um, and has not recompensated Haiti for this. Um, so the conditions uh, people in Haiti were talking about that this, this occupation had never ended. And this is a punishment for Haitian revolution um, that uh, guaranteed not just freedom for enslaved people in Haiti, but promised freedom for anyone who was seeking freedom from uh, former plantation colony. So this was a par uh, pariah state. Um, France demanded a indemnity in 1825 of 150 million francs. Uh, that they paid off only after the United States took over the loan, uh, 125 years later. Um, and as you can imagine, US foreign policy was, was united to squash any kind of hopes of the Haitian Revolution because the Haitian Revolution did inspire slave revolts. Gabriel Prosser, Den Denmark Vesey, and Nat Turner. So having an anthropological imagination helps us think through what, how these, it seem to be very disparate and distant uh, crises are, are directly connected because they are manifestations of plantation slavery and global racial capitalism. So this is what, uh, how you see uh, climate change and migration and uh, the situation in Haiti is all connected. So I'm just gonna show you pictures. I know my time is up. I'm just gonna let uh, you have this picture that you have to see that as a reflection of um, the deal between uh, right wing, right heads of state, 
which was a you know, reflection of the US support for another dictator. And the, this is the US occupation and the Haitian Revolution. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much, Mark, for that uh, excellent overview. Uh, so we'll continue. Um, Mimira, would you would you like to share your screen? And then we will have time for discussion um, Q and A uh, after. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, I forgot to try to get rid of that. So some of the things that I'm going to bring up, uh, Mark has already covered, but I think you know they're important points to reiterate that we can further unpack in the Q&A section. So I have a little PowerPoint just to guide me to the conversation I wanna have with you. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I think, um, as was, you know, I think that this whole charla is framed around our conversation about understanding migrants um, at the US um, Mexican border. And we've seen um, es essentially since, and, and Mark lifted that up for us right at the beginning of 2021, the massive deportation of Haitians back to Haiti, even while activists um, here in the United States were pointing to right unfit conditions, country conditions for folks to be returned. And we hear these terrible stories, right, of um, children who were just born being sent back to Haiti. Move my slide. Okay. And you know, Title 42 has been used essentially to promote and to justify, right, the removal of folks who could be bringing disease to hate to the United States, which is ironic, right, in light of the struggle that we're having here around vaccinated, unvaccinated peoples. And of course, it's not the first time that Haitians are presented in this particular way, or my, immigrants, migrants in general, as dirty as disease. And you can think back at the 90s and uh, 80s, 90s in Haiti in the United States, sorry, when Haitians were being understood as those who had brought about AIDS, right? Um, and were proliferating, you know, infecting people here in the United States. So there's already that relationship to thinking about Haiti migrants in general. And, you know, the liberal media, mainstream media, um, didn't necessarily do a very great job at explaining what was happening. Some folks were saying, well, this is related to the recent assassination of Moise and others were saying that it had been due to the earthquake that Mark mentioned that happened recently. But of course, if anybody knows about, you know, the, how, where these migrants were coming from, being that it was all the way from Brazil, Chile, then it would have taken them much longer to get there, right? So part of what I think Mark is doing here and what I wanna do is, set up for us um, an understanding of what brought these folks to Brazil in the first place and then to the US border. And, and to join essentially, right, the more than um, two point something million of incarcerated US Americans, right? If you think about um, Haitians having been at some point um, the largest number of people being detained, um, and so just to sort of keep contextualizing, again, Haiti within a discussion of US empire and not outside of the realities of um, what we're experiencing here in the States. There's a great documentary, I think, um, would help to understand a bit about this migration process, Shashidat Looking for Life, that you might want to take a look at at some point and, and, and gives you sort of, you know, on the ground experience of two migrants and their journey and why they've left. Um, and as we were, you know, as we're sort of, the, the media was looking at this 2021 moment as exceptional and new and surprising, right? What was left out um, of the conversation is resituating um, this migration wave with another one in 2018, when we were talking about the migrant caravans, among, with, among whom were many, many Haitians. 
but you also had Bangladeshi Cameroonian people. So it's also that we have a certain imagination, imaginary of who the migrant is that ends up at the US um, Mexican border. And really the Haitians are complicating that for us, um, but there are other folks who are there as well. And you know, a lot of us see the migration as a response to what we're calling um, the recolonization of Haiti. And I'm, talk, I'm gonna talk about that. And of course there are other responses, right? Some people are leaving and thou in the thousands, they say now there are over 100,000 Haitians in Brazil, right? And, and, and folks were responding to neoliberal predator, predatory capitalism in this way. But we also had folks who were responding by protesting, right? By that was um, put together by the folks that um, essentially started the Pito Caribe um, movement, right? So Mark gave us this context of 2018 when there's this first pay look, this shutdown, and afterwards we see in August um, different um, activists, artists, um, even you have doctors, right? All kinds of different folks who don't typically represent our idea of um, who protests in Haiti, um, use all kinds of other ways to make interventions, including protests, right? But to lift up right, what they were identifying as a major issue being state corruption. And later on, we end up seeing that um, the groups take on more militant tones, um, and this is what happens over time, over a course of three years. At the beginning, they were focusing on state corruption and on asking precisely what Mark um, brought up for us here. Uh, where is the Pito Caribe money? This two point two something billion dollars that had that had no trace, right? And that people were noticing unfinished buildings, um, lack of infrastructure, and they were trying to essentially push the state to reveal, right? Where, what have you done with this money, right? And this money could have uh, served um, to, towards a people-centered development. And again, we could talk about the specifics of the agreement, but it, unlike World Bank IMF loans, because it is a loan, um, the interest rate at which Haiti or all Caribbean countries who signed the agreement would have to return the money was extremely low. They also had a decades worth of time to return the money and to, re to really spend the money on social programming infrastructure, which is exactly the opposite of what IMF World Bank loans tell you to do, right? Um, it's actually for the state to retreat away from doing any kind of work that supports the people. So you saw, you know, as I said, artists coming up, you know, um, rap songs, um, all kinds of different graffiti work that I think, um, you know, Mark sort of showed us at some point in his presentation. And they were trying to not only pinpoint, right, who were, according to the, the data available, who had squandered this money, they were also asking for state accountability and wanting to show to the public, right, essentially, you will, you essentially owe this money, right? And to think about their own themselves as citizens, right? Who have the right to demand from not a failed state, but not even an incompetent state, but a state that is deliberately organizing abandonment in the country. And I can share the video if people wanna look at this a little bit long and I wanna move forward. And so again, as I was saying, you have different responses to um, this post 2004 moment that Mark drew out for us, right? When you have the overthrow of Aïcid, President-elect uh, Jean-Bertrand Aïcid, by a coalition of, uh, you know, right-wing paramilitaries, um, uh, the local business class, right, some quote-unquote members of the civil society, but certainly also the international, and we can talk about what were the reasons that um, he was so, his government was so threatening, 
that he had to be deposed a second time in the Q&A. Um, but this launches this moment of recolonization of Haiti that is deeply, that is extremely intensified in the 2010 earthquake moment. And I'm going to talk more about this moment um, because I think it helps to understand this migration pattern that we're seeing through Brazil into the US. It helps understand the modern, you know, the contemporary protests that have taken place over the last few years. And also the things that we don't hear about um, that are not co covered by, by mainstream media here in the United States, which include um, what the sort of story I put in the abstract that I wanted to call your attention to, which is, the, it's actually the date is January 20th and not 26th, in which there was a massive protest um, at a massive strike rather, I should say, at the Caracol Industrial Park that Mark mentioned earlier in the Northeast of Haiti, right? And, and the importance of the story is that, you know, over, over 60,000 jobs are promised. They were only able to go up to, I think about 13,000 at some point. And we can go into the story more specifically about this part because I think it reveals several different things that we're concerned about talking here, talking about here, which is, right, that, this um, particular park is how it came to be, right? What they're doing inside of this park and how we in the global North contribute to this, the, this phenomenon. Um, and so even, you know, we see this protest in 2022, right? You're thinking about the park. And so let's talk about how this park came to be for a little bit. And it gives us a lot of explanations about what's happening in Haiti um, right now. So the park is, comes out of essentially an agreement between USAID Interdevelopment, so United States Agency for International Development, USAID, the Interdevelopment Bank, right, and the Haitian state. And this happens right after the earthquake. So Mark talked about the earthquake. It specifically hits, right, Port-au-Prince in the South, but yet, <laughs> people are thinking about reconstruction, are thinking about the North, right? So what is so special about the North of Haiti that instead of focusing on providing housing and all other kinds of relief for the people who were victims of the earthquake that they're using the momentum to push development, quote unquote, in the North. And I have some pieces that talk more about, right? What, how the North had been understood even before the earthquake as a site of development and the earthquake becomes a perfect way to accelerate that. And so essentially the Haitian state creates a free trade zone, right? Which there are laws on the books even under the Juvalier regime that permitted um, you know, the transformation of land into these tax exempt areas and free trade zones exist throughout the planet so the Haitian state would not collect any taxes from any manufacturers or companies operating in the park for 10 to 15 years, but also borrowed right, money to build this park in the first place to incentivize right, foreign direct investment, in this case, to bring this South Korean company that had been operating out of Guatemala, which is the country right before Haiti that has the lowest minimum wages, and say trading was running away essentially from right people unionizing and asking for more money exactly the scene that we see that i showed you in the protest also right all kinds of accusations of sexual harassment and other types of worker violations so they come to haiti because it's the next site right that is not far away and also has really the lowest minimum wages on the entire region and of course, because right, the Haitian government is essentially subsidizing the move for them. And they produce clothing that we wear here, Gap, H&M, Zara, Old Navy, et cetera, right? So our consumption and overdevelopment in the North drives these kinds of projects. And essentially to do it, it's not that you know, this land was just empty and doing nothing. People were living on it and they picked the Chabelle um, Habitation Planté, an ex of, former plantation that was then transformed into a community. And they picked that site because it's right by, right, this bay in order for them to, right, essentially be able to evacuate all kinds of chemical waste straight into the river that, that leads to the ocean. 
And so the and it, of course, because the people who are there do not have the same kind of recourses, right, to fight against um, essentially state appropriating what is ancestral land. And you see some of the devastation, which is not just chemical waste, but also textile waste that's also being dropped off right at the bay. Um, and 2015, these folks who had been evacuated violently, who had been promised compensation, ended up forming the Collective Paysan Victim Teshabe, and it took them four years to be able to sign an agreement with, I, with the International Development Bank and the Haitian state, which again still has not been honored. And we see the repercussions of this land dispossession in the form of the protest, because some of the folks protesting are some of the folks who used to live on that land. And this is agricultural land, where people were able to produce food for their own subsistence and to sell in the market to send their children to school, for example, right? So this is a major blow for them. Um, and so I share this little map here that I'm still working on just to give you a sense of the area that we're talking about here in the north of Haiti. And you see the Caracol Industrial Park, right? That's the river I was talking about into the bay. And we see these little crosses are just marks of what Mark mentioned earlier, right? Mining sites for gold, for copper, for silver, for other things that may include Colton, for example, which goes into just, you know, part of what gives us the possibility to have these fancy, you know, iPhones. And thinking about how even the road, which is here in orange, really is one that was constructed and literally people call it the road of death, right? Um, and, and along a path of quote unquote development, which includes these mining sites, industrial parks, agribusiness, right? And a little less tourism, but you have Labazi here, which is the Royal Caribbean drops off people to go zip lining and do other things. So the North is generally seen as a site of, you know, quote unquote development around all these extractive um, projects. And certainly it is the land as, um, Mark said that is actually able to produce the food that would be able to feed the country, right? And part of the neoliberal plan is to say, well, don't worry about feeding yourself, right? Worry about producing export crops, which includes also, right, clothing, um, but, and, and don't worry about feeding yourself. So we'll take the land that can produce the food and we'll instead, right, import foods that, again, are subsidized by all kinds of laws both on the Haitian side and also on the US side. Because the Caracol Industrial Park, what's interesting about it is that you have this transnational group lobbying both the Haitian state to keep minimum wages low, to pass other laws that uh, essentially give rights to corporations as persons in Haiti. And, but you also have folks lobbying in the United States for laws that are gonna permit right um, tariff-free transportation of these clothes from Haiti into the US, right? Not paying taxes to the, the, the US state either. So there are, you know, all these things are tied together. And I just wanna leave us on one small note. I have no idea where I am for time anymore, but because I want us to think about the ways that Haitian people are contesting these extractive um, projects, right? Which, um, includes these protests that we're seeing in the major cities around state corruption and lack of infrastructure and lack of housing, lack of healthcare, et cetera. But in other ways too, in these areas in the North around these industrial parks, these um, agribusiness plans that there are, and you see the little green star that I put on the map here is the center of Afidepa, which is a women's organization that essentially, you know, to sort of summarize the kind of vision and work that they do around the concept of solidarity economies is for them to imagine a way right out of this extractive um, present and to think of post-extractive futures, right? Where the, the, the goal is to produce for local consumption. The goal is to produce in a way that respects right, the land, that doesn't deplete the soil. It is to produce in a way that um, renders human relations non-transactional, right? That, this is, that people are not necessarily in um, together because they're just trying to 
extract from the land and, and create profit, but that in fact, they're trying to produce solidarity, produce community. So I think, you know, the group has about a thousand members, which is not a whole lot, but if you think about a thousand people getting together to practice non-horizontal, non-vertical, sorry, horizontal, um, if you want cooperative economics, right, it's pretty challenging. These people own land together. They also, individual members give up their, you know, private property to the collective in order to produce, right? And when there is money that comes into the organization, it's reinvested into the organization and the members. And they have a, you know, we can talk about it if folks are interested, a very different way of thinking about solidarity and productivity that is not based on able, you know, your ability to produce quickly, right, towards surplus so that you can sell on the market for, you know, towards export, but rather to create, right, these bonds between people. So they have differently abled folks involved, elderly, infants, and they think across, right, the entire, you know, um, lifespan of a human, right, starting thinking about the infants all the way to the elderly. And they have 10 branches in the area. They produce, you know, sort of basic um, farming things that people consume in Haiti, right? I we're talking about beans um, and other types of vegetables and fruit, but also peanut butter, which is something that, you know, especially in the North is, is a very important good, but also some other artisanal work that they're able to sell as well. And so, um, I think this is, you know, and you see some of their products, you know, roots, vegetables, et cetera. And one of the things I wanted to highlight is that they have this Bureau for Seeds, right? Because part of what they're pushing for is that you have to grow, right? Quote unquote, indigenous things to the country rather than what Monsanto was pushing right after the earthquake, which is to provide um, GMO seeds coming from not Haiti, right? For peasants in Haiti to use. And so there was a pushback from this group creating this bank to say, we're gonna use our own products that mostly they're able to collect because people are trading what they have in their own gardens. So I'll stop here and hopefully we can ask questions, but I think it's important as we show the picture of you know recolonization of Haiti, that Haitians are responding in a variety of ways, including migration, Right, but also in the form of protests and the solidarity, solidarity economies. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of our speakers. Uh, so we did advertise this event is going on um, uh, for some extra time in order to build in more time for discussion Q&A. Uh, and so I invite um, all of you who are um, listening, if you wish, uh, you can turn your cameras on. Uh, you can raise your hands uh, to make a comment or a question. You can also write something in the chat. Uh, I will try to moderate, but I think also the speakers, uh, if you see a hand raised, you can, or something in the chat, uh, you can also uh, just jump in and respond. I have a question for you all. <clears throat> I, can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. I wanted to start off by saying thank you so much for your your time and energy and, and sharing your 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 knowledge and time with us. Um, I was wondering if if uh, you all might be able to comment or speak about the um, the current status or the current relationships with the Dominican Republic and what is happening <clears throat> with regards to migration on on that side of the island and. Uh, Perhaps your potential future, uh, or perhaps just future potential in, in what might be able to be happening, thinking about transnational relationships on that front. Yeah, um, you you asking the question means you already know the the 2013 Supreme Court decision stripping uh, citizenship uh, from anyone born after 1929, it's a case of birthright citizenship and the 2015 massive expulsion, including places uh, on St. Pete. Um, the recent elections in the Dominican Republic, the Haitian migration, um, it always plays a, a very large uh, role in, in this. Um, so um, I'm not sure that um, there's anything more specific. Um, 
the uh, twice, as, as I as I understand it, twice the border shut down during COVID. Um, but it was a leaky border shutdown because the uh, Dominican economy depends on being able to exploit Haitian poverty to uh, have an extra legal uh, flow of goods across the border towns. Uh, so that was um, uh, unfortunately a stake in uh, the Katsamba uh, the, the the gang that uh, that uh, kidnapped uh, 17 missionaries they're they're based in Kuala uh, and so there's some financial interest in that route um, but as far as the Dominican side um, I am not more familiar I'm not familiar with anything recent except for those two border shutdowns during the during COVID I don't know if Maria you're more on top of it I mean yes there have been the border shutdowns and some recent deportations um, taking place um, literally pulling out pregnant women, women in labor, because there was the, the, the fear of Haitian migrants coming in just to have babies, right? In the Dominican Republic in order to establish citizenship, but just to have also access to better healthcare. So there was a period or, you know, at some point this year that they were you know, re going into the hospitals and literally using that as a site of deportation um, and so the, the, that that was happening, and those things continue to happen. Even this law that um, Mark mentions, this amendment in 2013, that essentially was stripping the citizenship of of you know would have stripped the citizenship of up to 250,000 organizations in Haiti who are doing you know who are handling repatriation, deportation. Tell you that the numbers are it's twice as much, right? Um, and as Mark says, that you know there is this unofficial relationship too with Haiti, where I'll, I, I, we see these more official legal deportations, but they constantly need a flow of you know cheap labor coming out of Haiti to do all the work that Dominicans don't want to do, right? It's sort of the same idea that we have, the same thing that we have here, right? You, allow a certain number to come in legally, legally to do the work that, you know, supposedly is being stolen from uh, white workers who don't want to do that work anyway, by the way, the cleaning, the picking of the, the tomatoes, right? In the case of Haitians and Dominican Republic, sugarcane and other jobs um, and using that xenophobic discourse to justify their removal, but yet being very dependent on and this is the same thing we saw in Brazil. The Haitians going to Brazil were recruited, right? I remember being going to the airport and seeing hundreds of young people sitting out there waiting for flights, first to go to Brazil. And this is after Brazil wins the bid for the World Cup Olympics, right? And they're thinking about, you know, though we have a so-called progressive government in power, thinking about, right, who are the racialized cheap labor, laborers that you're going to use on these projects. And then you see with, once these projects were done, that the Haitians were going over to Chile for other construction, um, to do other construction work, right? And then when you have the well, rise of Bolsonaro, and uh, I forget his name in Chile, right? Then they start turning against these migrants, right? After having used them. And this is why all these folks start leaving and start walking for four months across 11 countries to the US, the US-Mexico border. Mm -hmm. wow. Specifically on the Dominican side, yeah, for those who probably know a little bit about this already, uh, for other folks who may not know that so deeply that the Dominican uh, companies were investing in the, the, the Haitian presidential election and, and they were supporters of the PHDK, the Haitian bald state. The political party in power that the Clintons um, put there in 2010. So there's, there's, um, you would ask why would Haiti let this happen? In, in part, it's because of patronage, um, yeah. Australia and other companies yeah. that were directly supporting the, the, the Haitian state. In Australia, they, they were companies who had contracts to build roads. Um, not only were they supporting these different, you know, can, you know candidates from that party. But also are part of the squandering of this two billion dollars that the folks are saying, where is that money gone? Right. 
they took the money and didn't build the roads. It's been 12 years. And I think pieces of this major interstate highway has been, have been built, right? And they've gotten multiple contracts and new Dominican companies have come subsequently to build exactly the same road that millions of dollars were already dispersed to, to build back in 2010 or 12 or 13. Uh, maybe I'll ask a question, um, unless uh, there's anyone else in the audience who would like to ask. I, oh, there is a hand up. Please go ahead, ask your question, and I'll save mine for later. Hello. Um, thank you for this talk, first of all. Um, I'm really interested in, in that collective you talked about um, as it challenges kind of this recolonization. Um, I'm wondering, this is always a question I have, how and um, whether you think it's appropriate, how should diaspora um, try to contribute? Um, you know, what ways can people um, internationally, um, you know, help to push back or, um, or support um, these kind of collectives that are forming? I think that's a great question. Um, that Mark and I spend a lot of time theorizing about and practicing in a variety of ways. Um, and maybe it's, it's a good you know, segue to talk about, well, how do you do solidarity with Haiti, not via these NGO ways and not via this concept of so-called civil society, right, in, in more direct contact. I think definitely there's always financial support, right, in a way that's not paternalistic. And that's just real, right? Um, part of solidarity work does include right, a transfer of um, funds, right? The global south is always sort of bleeding out to produce the development of the global north. So just being able to redistribute funds is one way, certainly, um, and in a more direct way that goes to the folks who are actually doing the work rather than these entities that we think are more um, somehow less corrupt and more reliable. And we see in, in Mark's story that that didn't turn out to be the case um, for the $12 billion, you know, for the reconstruction of Haiti, nor the 50 million that was given just, you know, recently in August. And, and obviously it means to have direct contact. I think one of the things I've been pushing for in non-academic spaces is for us to eventually organize some type of delegation for folks to come to Haiti in person, right, and to establish connections and not just hear from folks like me and Mark, right, um, and to unquarantine Haiti from the way that the world is presenting it, right, as illegible, um, even though obviously there are security issues to take, you know, very seriously. Um, I think also it's in, you know, spreading the information, writing about it, right, younger people producing, right, videos, TikTok videos, right, or whatever it is that y'all do as young people to get your message across. I, I'm like at that border, right? Like a little young still, you know, but I'm, I haven't crossed into certain social media, you know, realities yet. So I think clarifying, right, continuing to clarify what's happening in Haiti is what we need. We're at that moment where people like People are curious, but people are very confused. And Hades just seems like, you know, obscure to us, but translating Haiti very clearly. And I hope Mark and I did some of that, you know, for folks to understand the context. Um, I could, you know, I could think of some other ways too, right? Like supporting um, participatory, participatory action research projects. You know, Mark and I are exploring ways that we can support movements also specifically thinking about Savanzian, which are, I forget how many thousands of acres of land it is at this point that was essentially given by the Haitian state to this oligarch, to this, you know, um, transnational capitalist towards producing stevia for Coca-Cola and stevia for a whole lot of things. Like if you go to the supermarket, you just see stevia for tea and this and that and all kinds of products. So um, I think 
you know, supporting research that can help social movements to fight back, you know. Um, but also, I think the thing that we can do from where we are without having to go to Haiti on a delegation or give money, or do research, is to really question our form of development that drives the entire capitalist machine, right? Our constant need to consume clothing, to consume certain goods, to want to have right products, you know, it, no matter what the season, you want to have that product available at your supermarket, right? Endless flowers to adorn your house, right? Con you know, going to the mall every weekend to buy new clothes, you know, because it's on sale, right? That these are all the things that we're doing in the global north that continue to contribute to the carving up of the planet and to these, you know, different extractive projects. I have, a, I have an iPhone as well, right? But like every year people are changing their iPhones even if it's perfectly fine because it has an extra camera, right? Just like really questioning our own um, consumption and our ideas of the good life and, um, you know, really thinking about less, doing less. I think that's a form of solidarity you can do without leaving wherever you are, right? And Arizona. Mark. I mean, that was a question for, I mean, I don't have much to add except that, you know, as a non-Haitian, as non-diaspora, uh, we have to ask ourselves about solidarity and it really does require us to see how our lives are complicit. I think Maria already answered it beautifully. I just want to, you know, say amen or ayibobo in, in Creole. So um, just, uh, you know, support your, what I will add though is that if people in Haiti are asking me not just to like help in a particular moment, but like grasp the connection, like, you know, dismantling global capitalism in Haiti means dismantling it in, you know, in Arizona, in Illinois, where I teach. Uh, you know, the, look at the seed companies that are connecting Monsanto, Cargill, ADM, and, you know, disrupt the student debt uh, agencies that are collecting, you know, the, 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 the banks that are collecting it are also the ones that are investing in, you know, dirty capitalism elsewhere. So they, it, it requires conscious effort to, you know, to dismantle these efforts uh, locally. It also requires, a, you know, whatever word you want to use, solidarity, uh, education, so anthropological imagination to see how we are connected. Um, thank you. There is uh, one uh, question and comment also in the chat. I'm not sure if you can see it, Amira and Mark. Um, yes, I mean, to answer Peter's question, um, I think this is one of the things that Mark and I were saying in, in terms of the, this 2018 moment and how social movements, right, and how people came to organize themselves in a variety of formations, organizations, movements to speak back to um, corruption, right, that they identified as coming from the state. These had been demands that people were making almost forever in the history of Haiti, um, but that were intensified at this particular moment because people were specifically interested in the Peto Caribe money, like I said, that was very different than whatever quote unquote development loans come out of the World Bank and the IMF. So in terms of how people, how corruption is being dealt with, I would say from the bottom up, right? That folks were demanding more transparency and, um, you know, justice really for folks to be brought to justice. Again, this particular party that was put in power, um, the executive had the power to name, you know, the, the judges. And that means the judges became, um, you know, clients, if you will, of the executive, right, to follow orders and not to pursue certain people. And for us who are, you know, activists and researchers of Haiti, social movements, civil society, quote unquote, um, this, the U.S. imperialism, right, that, that, that the U.S., along with all of these other folks who compose what 
is called the core group and the core group was established in 2003, 2004, right before the coup. And it's a council that regroups the US, France, Canada, Germany, Spain, Brazil, the Organization of American States and the United Nations. And they essentially via the US embassy decided the outcome of elections because they did not want progressive or progressive leaning candidates to potentially win and respond to this question of corruption, right? respond to this chaos that your father saw being in Haiti and wanted people who were gonna perpetuate the chaos and who were going to facilitate the, the scramble for Haiti, the plunder of, Haitian, of Haiti's resources. So, you know, again, towards thinking about solidarity of those of us who are in the States, right, is to push back against U.S. empire, right? Um, and, and to not be complicit with the endless war machine that is the U.S., right, that we see what's happening in terms of U.S. aggression, you know, against Russia. Some of us think for no good reason in reality, right, that um, essentially U.S. is really, um, about producing chaos, right? That this chaos isn't something inherent about Haitians, but is imposed on Haitians. And when they make decisions to elect leaders that they feel, whether they're wrong or not, right, will actually resolve their problems. In this case, Jean Bertin and Aristide, those leaders are deposed. This happened with Aristide twice, right? There are internal critiques about him, certainly, right? that he wasn't perfect, but that he still was never allowed to finish his term because he was bringing about a different message and wanted to make, right, um, Haiti a very different place. This is not to sort of, you know, romanticize this particular leader, but it's to say that Haitians don't get to choose who they want. That decision comes elsewhere. And we see in this moment when Haitians are pushing back against this party that continues to be in power, even though their mandate never existed, and certainly has expired if it did, um, the United States continues to say, no, we're gonna diplomatically recognize this party because this is the party that's going to allow the US and, uh, and their friends to do as they please with Haiti, its people and its land. So I, I think if you, if you come away with anything is to rethink right, the way that we, we talk about Haiti and chaos as a produced chaos, as manufactured and not something that is, you know, um, inherent about the Haitian people, but something that is imposed, something that is created, um, that it's organized actually, right? To be exactly that. Yeah, this, um, you can't have democracy and, um, you know, extractivist capitalism in the, in the recipient end. So in order for the project of, uh, consumption in U.S. agribusiness and U.S. Uh, textile industries to work, you have to have dictatorships abroad. So that's, um, hey, there is a commission for the Haitian solution to the search of the Haitian solution for the crisis. And they are asserting themselves, they're asserting they, 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 um, Bureau of the follow up through or the um, implementation of the accord that they had last August and their there just was last this last week a debate about people that want to be president of the transitional council. So they are basically saying to the United States, go ahead and recognize who you want. We're going to assert ourselves. We're going to reassert our sovereignty in the way that the uh, so corruption needs to be thought of as, as you know, more than just like where did the money go, but like how do we get to define who gets to make decisions? So. Um, uh, there was a couple other questions uh, organizing amongst Haitians that are migrating. Um, so um, there, uh, so there is an organization. It's headquartered in in California that's been tracking the U.S. Uh, Mexico border through Tijuana, um, called the Haitian Bridge Alliance, and they've they've been stepping up uh, in this moment. But there are groups in Miami called the Family. Uh, it used to be called something else. It's called the Family Advocacy Movement Network, FUM, uh, Network Movement, FUM, and uh, Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees in, in, in New York. Uh, they all have deep, deep seated um, ties. Uh, it's also Undocu Black, it's Black Alliance for Just Immigration. There are, um, so for, as far as on the ground in Haiti, the um, 
So there's there's a there's an effort for uh, justice for the return migrants, uh, for deportees. Uh, that includes the um, uh, GAR, uh, the Group of Action and Reflection on um, for Refugees, G A R R, um, and um, I believe it's the Jesuit Center uh, for uh, Migration. They're the ones that were involved in the Plaza Pete. Uh, crisis in 2015, but it's a really ad hoc coalition right now. Um, there hasn't been, um, frankly, we're, we're, we've been ineffect, ineffective, ineffective because, um, you know, I think there's a, this idea that being right is, you know, um, how we need to be when, when talking to folks in Washington. And it is good that we have allies, uh, that there is a Haitian, the Haiti caucus at the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, some really great legislators are part of this, but as a, as a social movement, you know, that the Biden administration can continue this with impunity. We're up to about uh, 16,000, the uh, latest statistic I saw today, and to the deport deportation actions. Um, the fact that the Biden administration can make promises to the Haitian com uh, community in particular, um, uh, Black voters and uh, immigrant voters in, in general, and then systematically break them without political cost um, is testament to the fact that our strategies of, of, of solidarity are not working and we need to rethink them. You know, uh, the classic case of moving beyond ally, moving towards accomplice. You know, what are we willing to give up to stop the deportation machine? Um, yeah, and I, I think this is an important piece because, I mean, I'm not sure how everyone here is positioned ideologically. Um, that we tend to think of the Democrats as more liberal. Um, but in fact, again, you know, in the experience of Haitians in particular, right, um, in the 90s, Bill Clinton made similar um, promises and yet deported, you know, alarming rates Haitians um, back to Haiti, right, um, during a moment that was also very politically intense. So, as far as immigrants are concerned, and specifically Haitian immigrants, Haitian migrants, Democrats or Republicans, a, you know, government has not necessarily proven to be very different for them and their treatment. Um, so I think that's something I, I want to make sure we highlight here in thinking about the Biden administration and the ways that um, they continue to enact racist policies that um, at this point may seem like old news because we're focused on some other geopolitical issues, but um, that the Haitian folks that you know Mark is putting in the chat, that Elizabeth dropped as well, right, are trying to counter. And there was a recent you know document that came out from one of the organizations saying, you know, we're deeply disappointed and feel that Biden turned our backs, which for me is like, I'm not sure at what point he ever had your back in reality, um, and the Democrats ever did. So I just wanted to drop that as a comment. I think I dropped them all. I might have forgotten a few. Um, but these are the, the main groups that are that are working in solidarity. Um, the digital divide means that a lot of organizations in Haiti don't have web presences. Um, and if they did, the language would be in French or Creole. I'll, I'll, I'll keep looking, but these are the US-based solidarity groups that are organized constituencies. Um, and, and I think, God, I mean, they have a website, I think, but, you know, I, the, um, Haitian organizations have different kinds of resources and don't necessarily always have shiny websites. Right, for folks to go to. Um, but I know GAL produces um, newsletters every so often, sort of update people who are on their listserv, but it's written in French and Creole, right, about what work that they're doing. We, we can um, compile those links that you've posted in the chat, Mark, and we can send them out to uh, everybody who has registered for this event. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think the issue is also that uh, this is just in terms of capacity to respond. You know, there is there is an active, you know, top-down supported gang, you know, 
gang war uh, where the the, the uh, armed irregular folks in Haiti um, have massive control over 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 the territory of Haiti. Certainly, the if you look at where in Port-au-Prince they're sealing it off from the rest of the country systematically, on top of like being having an earthquake, on top of uh, you know uncertainty regarding the political situation, asking this country to receive eighteen thousand people in the span of four months. Uh, there's just no like even if there were the organizations, uh, the capacity to respond is such that you know there are there are people that we really don't know what happened to them because you know no one's meeting them at the airport. Um, and even if they couldn't make it to the airport, they're not certain that they, could, they would get back. And so this is, even if there were Haitian organizations and they're trying to scale up their capacity, they're, they're, you know, the U.S. government is, you know, acknowledging that there, there's a disaster and the U.S. government is supporting people to that disaster. It's the U.S. government's telling me as a foreign as a U.S. citizen that I should stay away and sending Haitian people back. Right. People in Haiti are definitely, on, you know, on top of this being, you know, uh, deliberate. I mean, it, it's no other way to. It's 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 hypocritical and it's racist at its mm -hmm. core. Um, and, and that's what an example of the chaos that is purposely being created, right? That you know, on the one hand, you go on the site, the U.S. embassy site for Haiti, it says, you know, foreign people do not come. Red, you know, it's red, 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 right? Like kidnappings, protests. I mean, they put all that stuff in one category. Um, but yeah, they're deporting thousands and thousands of people back to a country that they're saying is unstable, and then saying, yes, this country is, you know, has democracy, and these are the people we think represent that democracy when none of them have been elected. And it's really a handful of them, right? All sort of, um, there's no parliament. It's all an executive body that's operating with its own named cabinet. And it's not someone who ever was, you know, chosen by any group of people whatsoever just named to power. And you know, we say, well, that looks like democracy to us. And we support that, right? And we're gonna send all these Haitians back to it. And then we have this contradictory messaging to US citizens about, you don't wanna go there, right? It's chaos, it's upside down, you know, to quote a former um, leader of this country, right? It's a shithole, right? So don't go there. So you have these contradictory narratives being deployed at the same time about Haiti. Um, and, and again, right, that doesn't, it, and, and yet the Haitian people are sort of caught up between that. And I think, you know, Mark is saying this, like there's a housing crisis here in the United States, all over the planet. There's one in Haiti too. And the land that people, you know, used to live on, like the one that I talked about earlier in the presentation, and, you know, we're living in communities, they're being forcibly displaced from, right? So those who do have some amount of land in their own housing are being displaced. Some of them are the ones returning, right? Who left, were able to migrate and then have been returned. Some of, in, in a lot of these organizations report that these folks had to sell their land sometimes, right? In some ways are a little coerced into selling, but sometimes they sell it because they think they needed 4,000 US dollars just to be able to get from Haiti to Brazil, right? And to have them to walk from Brazil to the U.S. and be returned to Haiti to nothing um, is, it's extremely devastating, right? So this chaos that Peter mentioned is not just random uh, or emanating from the Haitians, it's being created and imposed, manufactured. Mm -hmm. I think also particularly the way that the discourse of border crisis is, is manipulated. Uh, in order to deport the Haitians, when in fact, along the border, the community organizations do have the capacity to receive Haitians, right? But yet there's that manipulation of that idea that the Haitians are creating crisis um, at the border, which is just not true. And that they're disproportionately deported as opposed to other groups, right? So there is generally you know, an anti-migrant, xenophobic, reality right to the united states but there's a particular disdain for haitians right that i think we, we we have to highlight and even within immigration movements i think you know they're doing better on this and have traditionally sort of left haitians out right mm -hmm. of the conversation mm -hmm. and see that you know at least this year 
Um, in the last three years, I think there's been a shift to include Haitians more when we talk about TPS, temporary protective status. But you know, there is that inherent anti-Blackness, but specifically anti-Haitianness that mm -hmm. operates in the US that, even, that comes to bleed even into so-called progressive movements like the immigration movement in which Haitians are again left out. I, I was mentioning in the chat that although the Biden administration maintains that it's being forced by the courts to reinstitute the so-called uh, migrant protection protocols, the widely misnamed um, MPP program, there was nothing in any court ruling that said that the Biden administration needed to, to expand MPP um, to the whole Western hemisphere, whereas under Trump, it only included Spanish speaking countries. And so that seems a clear attempt to include Haitians um, mm -hmm. MPP in ways that um, there, there is no reason that the Biden administration needed to do that. There's no court <laughs> order uh, forcing them to do that. Yeah, it, it, what it allows them to do is to, it, and people in Haiti, when I was there, last there in, in January, were calling him a free rider. Biden was a free rider on, on the, the previous administration's policies. Like he's basically administering Trump's foreign policy. I don't, there's, there's very subtle shifts and not, not um, if there are substantive shifts, I would like to see them. Um, but also that he's a free rider on the fact that he won his nomination because he was vice president for the first world, the country's first black president. And he got a pass where you might not have otherwise if he was just the Biden in 2008 that called his, you know, former boss, you know, an articulate black man, you know, like they, he was given that he's just, um, he's not being held accountable in the same way because of um, um, our inability to think out, you know, think outside the two party system. And I think, uh, if we look at the on the ground activists, so in Arizona, I don't know what they're what what kind of activism you all have, but really like um, Opal Tumeni really inspired me to think through like what it means to be both black and immigrant, and the movement actors need uh, are engaging conversations that are intersectional. But there's something particularly about Haiti. Um, I have a documentary film that I co-produced, co-directed, and I screened it at lots of places. I stopped asking this question because it depressed me, but at about, about 1,200 people, I asked them to write down the first word that came to their mind when they heard the word Haiti and raised their hand if it was positive. Only one out of about 1,200 said their first impression of Haiti was positive. So there's something very particular to anti-Haitianism, but it is also nested with anti-Blackness, anti-immigrant um, sentiment, and I think having that sort of ground up solidarity politics as activist scholars, as activist students, as student organizations, as campus um, organizations, we have the ability to uh, facilitate these kind of um, collaborative dialogues and, and really lock arms. You know, it, you know, the way to stop a deportation is to chain yourself to a bus. The way to stop dirty capitalism is to, you know, stop it at the port. I mean, they're, 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 we do need to be able to think of this as an issue that is domestic as well as foreign, that, you know, that this, that this anti-Haitianism is striking at the heart of what, how we define ourselves, you know, um, and, you know, that faith-based groups, immigrant groups, um, civil rights groups, labor groups, uh, we need to be able to, think, you know, see the connections. Why well, I use the word anthropological imagination, but, you know, use whatever concept you need. It, having, having that, like, ability to move beyond, you know, just writing a letter to the editor or signing a petition or doing something that's like a, a briefing because um, these strategies are not working and maybe it is a part of you know NGOs headquartered in the United States to be just a performative ally I'm asking myself that um, so um, uh, there's a question from Ash Anshin Gupta yeah um, you know I, I'm not sure I have the that data on the tip of my fingers but I can say that through title 42 uh, Title 42 is being used on the border uh, to largely close down the, the border for Central Americans, uh, with some exceptions such as Nicaraguans, but for Hondurans and Guatemalans uh, especially. I don't I have the data right at the tip of my fingers about how many are being deported uh, versus how many are simply being expelled uh, back to Mexico. Uh, but but I think that's also happening. Um, well, we are um, out of time, and I, I and I want to thank our speakers again. 
um, as well as all of you uh, for participating. I, I appreciate so much the way that the speakers, the way that you gave us both an archaeology uh, of the present um, by you know really going back into history and showing the the legacy of punishment really against Haitians, but and also um, the multiplicity of resistances that are going on uh, in Haiti and and the ways in which we might connect the the critical border work and pro migrant work uh, with those demands in Haiti. So I want to thank you so much. Um, we will send the links out. Um, to the people who have registered. Uh, so thank you again so much to our two speakers and, and to everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you.